we don't really push the envelope. More like open it. This is Litopia, After Dark. The Net's first and foremost literary salon. A feast of ideas for your hungry mind. So pull up a chair and let's talk. Greetings and welcome to Litopia After Dark. I'm Ian Wynn, the techno-pagan octopus messiah, who, along with my co-host, esteemed super agent Mr. Peter Cox, are here to present to you a show brimming with laughter, with humor, and I'm going to start with a gag. Oh, no. There's only one answer to this question. Do you want to hear my blowjob gag? Oh, God. Uh, it's a bit early in the show, but yes, why not? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Tonight we have a very special guest, uh, a scion of British television, who's uh, written for some of the biggest comedians and stars of British broadcasting. The problem is, as an American, I've barely heard of these guys. Does that make me a terrible person? Yes, it does. <laughs> Peter, let me ask you something. Yeah. Have you heard, yes or no, of Bob Barker? No. Pat Sajak? Uh, vaguely. Alex Trebek? No. Richard Dawson. Richard Dawson. Not Dawkins. <laughs> Not Dawkins. I was going to say something at evolution. Although he may have been, he may have been no, atheist. I haven't heard of him either, no. Uh, Bob Barker was the host of The Price is Right, which uh, became uh, The Price is Right over here. Yeah. Uh, Alex Trebek is the host of Jeopardy. Pat Sajak, Wheel of Fortune. Richard Dawson was the original yes. host of Family Feud, which over here became Family Fortune, uh, I believe was hosted by Les Dennis. The only reason I know that is because he was on Ricky Gervais's extras yeah. in an absolutely hilarious episode. Yeah, reinvented his career, didn't he, really? Yes. Yeah. But you haven't heard of these folks, but nope. most Americans have. And here we have a writer for some of those counterparts. Pete, would you yeah. like to please introduce I absolutely who will. do you have in the studio with us tonight? Not your usual Friday night, is it? It's with great pleasure. Um, our guest tonight, I think, could justifiably be called Mr. Light Entertainment UK, actually. Let me first briefly list a tiny fraction of the shows that he's written scripts for. Blankety Blank, Blind Date, Bob's Full House, Bob's Your Uncle, Bruce Forsyth's Takeover Bid, Catchphrase, Celebrity Secrets, Don't Try This at Home, I think that was with uh, Davina McCall, Family Fortunes, Gladiators, one... I've only got to the letter G. We could grow old <laughs> gracefully together before I'm done. But let me just add, he's written scripts for a great many special events, such as the BAFTA Awards, the ITV Chef of the Year Awards, Children in Need, and a glittering galaxy of A-list British stars, such as most of these I think you've heard of, Ian, such as Sir Roger Moore, Sir Michael Caine, Lord Attenborough, Simon Callow, Robert Hardy, Michael Crawford, OBE, and Roland Rat. Uh, he writes for Jethro, Paul O'Grady, Chris Tarrant, Mike Yarwood and Des O'Connor and the late, great Kenny Everett, who's kind of strangely similar to you, Ian, actually. You may be channeling him tonight. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. At this point, I think I ought to Is ask... Is he still with us? No, no, no sadly. He, what? he died some years ago, actually. So Did people look at his coffin and say, man... That guy owed me a lot of money. No, they didn't. Oh, I don't know, actually. Well, it's possible, it's well, possible that, that Colin will tell us. Well, my aspirations are higher than that, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, at this point, I've got to ask you, do you want me to go on all night? Because I certainly could do listing all the things I, that I guess. Honestly, this, this, this CV, um, it, it's literally, we have to wear safety boots to carry it around. Because yeah. uh, the, names, the names on here are, are pretty darn heavy. Yeah, they are. They're and stellar. we're both in socks. Let's so hear from we... him directly. It's, it's Colin Edmonds. Good evening, Colin. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Ian. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm, I'm very, very flattered to be here. Hey, it's fantastic to have you on. Thanks it absolutely for... Absolutely is. I mean, that, that you know, I'm, I'm looking... And I guess probably a partial list. And it goes on five pages. Five uh, pages. Yeah, do you know how much printer ink is? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I managed to eke my CV out for as long as possible for you. I mean, you are, you know, you are right at the top of the tree, aren't you? Uh, well, let's, let's put it this way, Peter. Uh, I wasn't found out for a very long time. And I, and I got terribly lucky. It's very modest of you. Okay, don't give me this. I've only recently been discovered crap. Because <laughs> with this CV, it's not, it's not going to fly. You want me? Well, come on and break the door down. I'll be waiting. With a bun and a pack of sandwiches. 
Okay, I want to take you right back to the beginning, Colin. You, there you are, a 16-year-old lad. Yes. What, what was your ambition? My ambition at the age of 16 was to be a writer. I loved writing. I loved words. Uh, I loved reading books. Uh, books by a, a very famous British authoress called Enid Blyton. Oh, yeah. Um, much maligned now, because yeah. she's not, now not terribly PC. I think Enid Blyton was probably in her way, the J.K. Rowling uh, yes. of her time. Good comparison. Such was her fame and yeah. such was her book sales. And uh, Enid Blyton was extraordinary for me because I lived in a, in a small upstairs flat in Kensal Rise with my parents. And, and that, that's in the middle of town. And we didn't have a car. So my escape was through the books and adventures of Enid Blyton. She would write marvellous books of children who had these terrific adventures, The Famous Five, yeah. 24 novels about The Famous Five, uh, half a dozen novels about The Secret Seven. And, you know, these people, these, these young people would be whisked away to mysteries on secret islands. Mm. Um, five Go to Smuggler's Top was... Um, Nancy Drew. Yeah, Nancy that's Drew, what I was Nancy Nancy the Drew, Hardy Nancy Boys. Drew. That's right. There we are, the yeah. Hardy Boys. The Hardy Boys. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, and uh, well, the Nan Judy Bloom. Judy Bloom. Judy yeah. Bloom. Yeah. We yeah. must, we must, we must increase our bust. I will never forget Judy Bloom. I always thought it was the Nancy Boys and Hardy Drew, <laughs> but that, uh, <laughs> I, I must have been mistaken. That was a series of films. Ah. Oh, you saw those too. Having said that, Ian, you must have done, because I must admit, your physical business with your gagging gag at the beginning yeah. of the show... It's quite was, disturbing, wasn't it? It was yeah. <laughs> it's quite astonishing. Yes, it was. <laughs> well, we like... We <laughs> Not like in to, a good way at We all, like to break the ice. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did, I wrote my first novel, age seven, and it was a direct copy, word for word, over eight pages of handwritten uh, full scap, uh, a direct copy of Five Go to Smuggler's Top. All I did was change the names, and I stole Enid Blyton's plot uh, and her dialogue, but that was my first novel. Uh, and her uh, mild racism. At the age of, well, <laughs> not, yeah, well, maybe. maybe. I, don't think, I don't think, I think you can accuse her of all sorts of things, but I don't think you can accuse her of that. Well, yeah. I, I was just, that was a shot in the dark, and I obviously missed. I, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't sink anybody's battleship. What were her, what were her transgressions against, uh, against the politically correct community? I don't think she did that much. I mean, she just wrote about nice middle class kids having, you know, good, clean, wholesome fun. Listen, you guys intimated, yeah, that she would that she's much maligned now. Well, she is. She is. She's Be not. She's not PC. She's um, not, well, she's there not. we are. Why? Um, she I don't know why we're putting her under the mi under the microscope. I think because because nobody else is going to. There That's we are. Why oh, yeah, doing. the poor woman. And in truth, you know, she only, she lived about seventy miles from where I live now. And so I thought, well, I, I, I owe Enid Blyton a great deal, so it'd be nice to give her a quick mention, yeah. a, bit, a quick puff. Um, but she was the inspiration for my first writing. She got me... And fair play... So, so she's more than the inspiration, actually, Colin. Well, I suppose... <laughs> she, she basically ghostwrote for you. It sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> Enid Blyton was Colin Edmund's ghostwriter. <laughs> <laughs> sounds uh, like you owe her one of those supermarket-sized checks. <laughs> well, I wish. Um, so that... She... And she got so many kids of my age into into writing, into into reading, and interested in words, and then writing. Yeah. So I, I think she deserves a pat on the back for that. Then I moved on to uh, the the Adventures of Biggles by oh, yeah. by Captain W. E. Johns, um, and they were uh, he was a an, a, an aviation uh, hero. He was a wonderful aeronaut uh, flying biplanes, and that's when I wrote my first joke. I distinctly remember. These are about planes that yeah. have pre preferences for both sexes. Sure. But here's the joke. Here's the joke. Uh, double, Captain W.E. Johns in his Biggles canon wrote, oh, 20, 30 Biggles books with titles like Biggles Flies North, Biggles Flies Into Danger, Biggles Flies to the Gobi. And I thought, do you know, I'm, and I'm quite young now. I'm still in single digits, age-wise. <laughs> and I thought, hmm. Why don't I write a book about Biggles forgetting to do his trousers up? And here's the joke. It's called Biggles Flies Undone. Well, you when... Did, you'd, Colin, honestly, hand on heart, you wrote that one. Did you, did you really write that one? Yeah, I, I've got to admit, I wrote that. Because that is an iconic joke. I mean, no end, generations of comedians have, have used that. And yes. you, you wrote that. I, I, I must admit, I can't claim original authorship, but I certainly wrote it at the age of well, nine. That's extraordinary. I've, I've shaken the hands of the man who wrote that. That's, that's amazing. Well, I'm, maybe I'm giving myself airs in claiming authorship, but it's such an obvious joke. And, it, and of course, 
like all jokes, it's, it benefits for, for being in the Y fronts. If you, can get, if you can get a joke into the trouser area, yes. you're halfway there to Absolutely. getting a laugh. Yes. If, yes. It can be, if it can grace a joke with an element of smut. Because <laughs> I, I thought the obvious gag involved Biggles cannon shooting at the biplane. I, I don't know. I, you don't know who Biggles is. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> But, <laughs> I, but again, that could be the name of, of, a, of a rather um, unsavory internet film. Biggles had associates called Algae and Ginger. Yes. Uh, and and I'll, you just make your own jokes up now. Oh, we, uh, well, okay. Uh, Pete's a vegan. He's got that in jars in the kitchen. Thank you. Touche. Rimshot. Um, okay, so you you came up with this, i got to say again, iconic joke, and it obviously tickled your fancy, and it's tickled the fancy of millions of people since then. I mean, that's, uh, they went viral in, you know, modern day... It's a viral joke. <laughs> it's still good. Yeah, it's still good. It's still after all those years. So, what happened then? So, you, you, how do you gravitate more and more towards writing comedy? Which I've got to say, I think we haven't covered at all well on the Toby After Dark. It's high time that we we do talk about this. And in many ways, I think it's it is the most difficult form of writing. Actually, writing for people's humorous tastes that can be so difficult and so eclectic. It, um, I would say that there are many tricks to the trade, like all writing genre once you get into the subject you, you learn the tricks of the trade and little areas to spot and how you can form a joke mm. but my, my my comedy upbringing really started with radio um sunday lunchtime radio shows like uh, sorry ian you're not going to know round the horn yeah you might know the goons oh no round the horn was a i think that was magellan you can still get this on the <laughs> bbc iPlayer to know, name a competitor and yeah. they are well worth listening to. I've been listening to uh, Around the Horn, and, you know, so much of it still stands up, I think. And Kenneth Horn was uh, one of my heroes. Brilliant. Had a Brilliant. wonderful voice. Brilliant. Yes. Wonderful voice for radio. Yeah. Um, and uh, wonderful characters in a, in a great sh radio show written by uh, Barry Took and Marty Feldman. Yeah. Uh, you'd have heard of I Marty know Feldman. Marty Feldman, absolutely. Right. There's one I've heard of. Now, Marty Feldman... With the bug eyes and young Frankenstein. That's exactly, exactly. right. Now, Marty yeah. Feldman, a hero of mine, cut his teeth effectively I, I guess on round the horn a radio show for the bbc uh, in the 1960s and i used to listen to that every sunday oh it was joy and there were other radio shows like the navy lark which is a sitcom about uh, the royal navy uh, there was a sitcom called the clear the road kid uh, they were meat and drink to me on a sunday lunchtime waiting for waiting for sunday dinner to be cooked Sit, oh that in that flat in kensal rise listen to that bush radio oh that was oh joy and that really piqued my interest in, in comedy and and what those those performers were saying and how that audience laughed. That was intriguing. That was a live studio audience back yeah. then. Yeah. It was live. Yeah. So was... You would get genuine laughter. Yeah. Genuine laughter, absolutely. If it died, it died a death and you could hear it. And it would be there broadcasting live. Um I'm inclined to think maybe it was taped. But Taken. for some of it must have been live. But yeah, but in those days, of course, there weren't. And, and, and Peter, you would know this better than me. There probably weren't the editing techniques and the dubbing techniques that there are now. No, in those days, not nearly so easy to drop in canned laughter. Yeah. So what they laid down on tape is what they broadcast yeah. effectively. And they, they were they were terrific writers, and that piqued my interest. Then, on a, 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 a summer holiday, we went down to the seaside town of Torquay. And I think it's the Princess Theatre down there. We saw a comedian called Larry Grayson. Ah, oh, sorry, another name. You're not going to light to Ian. It's it's fine. It's fine. And Larry Grayson was one of the very first camp comedians, wasn't he? He was. Um, and he paralysed the audience. I sat in this theatre audience and witnessed people shrieking with laughter and wiping their eyes. And I thought, God, this is marvellous. What a reaction that this man on stage... Can, can make these people do this. It, it was extraordinary. He was marvellous. Uh, and he, he, his characters were characters like Slack Alice and Poppet in Pete. <laughs> and, and bear in mind, he had a gay persona. And he always said oh. that his best friend was Everard Farquharson. <laughs> well, that put the crowd away. That was hilarious. And he, and, and he wouldn't do jokes. He wouldn't perform jokes. You remember him, Peter? Yeah, I do, yes. He would say things like, I, I told you, didn't I? He's a liar. I he never a, I think he had a sort of uh, there was an aura of Frankie Howard about him, wasn't there? Yeah, sort there was rather ro offended innocence, actually. A absolutely, absolutely. He would look at the way I was dressed today, uh, if before you now, in my in my V-neck sweater and my shirt, and he would take one look and say, "Ill-advised," <laughs> but he'd say it with such weight that it it was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it because <laughs> no, but if you can get a 
a good comedy character, then you're halfway there. And if you get a good comedy character in your wife runs, uh, you should probably go in the other room. So, so here you are. You're exposed to all all this really, you know, formative stuff. Yeah. But unlike, I guess, you know, today's stand-up comedians who who see something and say, I want a bit of that, I can do that as well. You said, no, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be like them. I want to be the person behind the scenes who writes for them. Songwriter Why? Why? of jokes. Yes. Um, behind the scenes because I didn't think, looking like this, I, I'm very visual. Looking like what? Look, 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 look like this, Peter. <laughs> As I peer at you from behind the microphone. Are we talking about a lack of self-confidence here? You know, absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. I well, didn't... You know, you've just... You just I've just had you to don't strike me just, as a shrinking violet, sir. He's just gestured towards his sort of head and shoulders, but there's nothing weird about you. <laughs> you know, I, I like to think that the Patrick Stewart look-alike uh, competition is in... Uh, oh. I'm, I'm going to have a chance with that. We've got two baldies in the studio. <laughs> That's what it is. Hey, isn't it got a withering look then from Ian? How, da- how dare you? Oh, and isn't it great when you come out as a baldy finally? Oh, no, I, I went early. There was a basketball player when I was growing up. His name was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, and he was the highest scorer of, in the history of the Basketball Association. He played center for the Los Angeles Lakers, who were my team growing up. And he went bald like a carpet in a, in a, in a, in a kennel or something. With I mean, in patches. And, and I know from a very early age watching these basketball, I am not going bald the way Kareem went bald. Mm. Finally, he gave it up and started shaving, but for about five years there. So as soon as I started to lose it on the top, out came the razor. I have a five-inch tall gay barber. His name is Gillette. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I recommend him to anyone who's uh, starting to go bald much, much cheaper than mm. the hair transplant surgery. Well, yes, I must endorse that. Um, I, I, gosh, I tried... When I started losing at the front, at the back, the male pattern baldness, I tried every trick I could. I combed it from under the arm to, to cover I, my eyebrows, sweeping them back I, just I to did cover nose the hair. I did nose hair, but that wasn't a good look. That wasn't a good yeah. look. The trouble, you grow your nose hair, and when you sneeze, it cracks like a whip, and it's very embarrassing in company. <laughs> Absolutely. No, but, we've all been there. But isn't it great? But I've got to tell you, if you're losing your hair, come out as a baldy, because, you know, what... The day you do, it's such a great weight off your shoulders. It's a great weight off the top of your head, but it's a oh boy, you know, I'm bald. Talk, and talk to me about snowflakes falling, and you're in a warm sweater. You're not cold, but you got to and you and you you break out the egg. You take the hat off, and yeah. the snowflakes fall and steam right off of that. People with hair, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I have no you idea what, what you're talking about. about. How, about this? How about this hot Long night? Soul. Cool pillow? Oh, oh come bliss. on now. Oh, it's better than what, so what many What are you things. talking about? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, exactly. Sorry, this is the arcane <laughs> mysteries of baldness, Peter. <laughs> How dare you laugh? We're talking about leukemia. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Like Latopia. Then click the like button to share us with your friends on Facebook. It's what friends are for. This is the crucial question. How did you break in? I broke in by watching a show called The Golden Shot, yeah. which uh, was... A, a live, no, not a porn film. Go on. <laughs> uh, no, but oh, get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> Sorry, this Peter. Is this my influence? Yes. I think I, he's <laughs> quite normal. I'm really, I'm re- I don't know. I don't know what's <laughs> happening to me. I just, uh, you want to hear my blowjob Let's, gag? Sorry. I mean, uh, no. Tell tell our listeners what the Golden Shot was. It, it Gold- was watched by millions of people, wasn't it? On a Sunday, I think. Golden Shot was an extraordinary television concept. It was mm. a live show, and it it enabled viewers at home to play the game along at home. Uh, it was a crossbow mounted on front of a television camera, aimed at a target, with a blindfolded cameraman operating the camera on which the crossbow was attached. Really clever idea. Yes. Yeah. So you're live at home and cut to the crossbow camera and you can see the sight at home. Mm. And you're on the telephone to Bob Monkhouse in the studio and you give directions to the cameraman to try and hit the target. So, iconic phrases like, up a bit, stop, left a bit, stop, right a bit, stop, and the cameraman would adjust accordingly, fire, pull a trigger, and this uh, crossbow bolt would shoot across the studio to hit an apple or miss or explode or whatever. Couldn't do it now. Imagine health and safety, Peter. Yeah, yeah. But what a great idea, because it was, it was, as you say, live TV, and therefore inherently dangerous. Not physically, or perhaps it even was sometimes. Were there people near the target? There was a, there was a live studio audience. Um, they were sitting at the other end of the studio, and all the targets were at the other... Well, at one end of the studio, and the audience were at the other. So, technically, there was no danger, but it, 
it was, would you have said, the first interactive television yeah, show? Yeah, absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt, it was, absolutely. It was an yeah. extraordinary William Tell type concept. Yeah, yeah. And money could be won. You could, you, uh, boy. Oh, so you, this was a game show? This yeah. was a game show. Oh, okay. Yeah, which required. Oh, the, I got you. Skill so, as, as an archer. And this is where you, you decided to cross, cross yeah. over to the dark side. That's exactly right. Well, I saw this performer, Bob Monkhouse, hosting this show live, and it was fraught with danger. As you can imagine, mm. uh, and in nineteen in the nineteen seventies, when television uh, was still, um, it was the only game in town. Yeah, it wasn't. But it, things could and did go wrong all the time. And you're, you know, you're up there in front of ten million uh, viewers. And, ten million. Oh, I'm oh. sure it could have easily yeah. been that. Sunday, and you know, and something goes wrong technically, and you've got to fill in. And that was part of his genius, wasn't it? Absolutely, he could control that situation. Beautifully, um, it, as is evidenced by uh, two hosts who took took over the show after Bob left the Golden Shop. Uh, uh, two comedians took over in quick succession and really were woefully exposed they couldn't be, do it. because they really couldn't do, they it. couldn't do it. And I'm not going to embarrass them by naming them. They're both they've both passed away now. Uh, you but can't not, they can't be embarrassed then, can they? Yeah. Well, one was a, a can't sue either. Oh, one was oh, a charming good. man called Norman Vaughan, who was a very nervous performer anyway and really struggled. Yeah. Another was a, a terrific black Yorkshireman called Charlie Williams, oh, yeah. who was who was marvellous. He was a great comedian, but couldn't hack it in that live environment. No. Um, so in the end, uh, the television company saw saw some sense and sent for Monkhouse. Bring Monkhouse. They got back. him back again, didn't they? They brought him back, and it. And what, at what point did you actually start writing for him? And how did you break through? You know all the the retinue surrounding him to say, well, well, I've got some jokes for you. Yeah, that was that was really quirky because I got lucky. Oh, oh gosh, I've I've been lucky for forty years, but I got lucky. I the writer on. Golden Shot, Bob Monkhouse's writer on Golden Shot was a, a charming man called Wally Malston. And I had the chutzpah at the age of 16 to write to Wally Malston saying, um, I'm very interested in writing jokes. Could you give me some advice, please? And he very kindly gave me That's some advice. That's a great way to get someone's attention, listeners, actually. If you want, you know, you, you want to get through to a big, important, powerful person in the trade, ask them, ask them for some advice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he was very generous uh, and said, if you'd like to send some jokes that I can show Bob then by all means because it'll certainly take the pressure off me and so I submitted my jokes to, to Wally who gave them to Bob uh, and then I got a note from Bob saying most of these require work but some of them are okay there's there's a few good thoughts here so may I please encourage you to, to keep trying uh, it was like subletting your jokes well I suppose but you know it's a way through the door Ian yeah you no, know it's a first time you got yeah. you got to get out there absolutely and and the more context you have in any form of writing um the the, the more chance you got yeah um wally then left bob monkhouse to work for another performer and um, bob monkhouse pulled in another writer another uh, very very clever man called uh, dennis burson uh, who then wrote for bob but in the meantime i was still sending stuff to bob to use in a in in cabaret and for private functions, not necessarily TV work. So I would write topical jokes, uh, which he would use uh, in the course of cabaret, and and I started getting some checks. And I've got to say, Ian, they were they were pretty good checks. How old were you? I'm now. Let's call me now. Oh, I've got to be seventeen now. Oh wow! wow. <laughs> yeah, bad, eh? yeah. I'm still at school. I'm studying for A level. Has anyone seen your <laughs> face? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, which, which is a perfectly fine face, I should add. For well, I didn't this, yes, that this film a few years ago called Nearly Famous. Did you Did you see that? It's a sweet little film. Okay, it's, it's called true. Almost Famous. Almost Famous. Oh, you're right. God, sometimes sorry. you're sorry. Toehold on popular. It's a culture. true story, isn't it? True story about this this kid who sends articles up to Rolling, Rolling Stone, Stone, Jay yes. Wenner, and he gets them published, and he has to hide the fact that he's only seventeen. This This is it's, This is Colin's story. Well, well, well I, I wish. Uh, what was interesting from my point of view was that it then encouraged me while writing private jokes for Bob Monkhouse for his, for his cabaret and um, shows off of television. Um, I got interested in other TV shows, so I started to submit jokes and sketches to other TV shows. And just I was just 
I was just about to start, oh no, I was still, still 17, when I sent up some jokes and some sketches to Dave Allen. Who, oh, right. You may remember yeah. Peter. Dave Allen was an Irish comedian. Terrific. He was a sit-down yeah. comedian. He wasn't yeah. a stand-up comedian. Yeah. He was a sit-down comedian. He would sit at a chair with... Uh, on stage. On stage or in a TV studio with a side table uh, with a large whiskey resting on the, on, the, on the side table, a cigarette in his hand, and he would smoke and he would drink. And he was a terrific raconteur. And he would tell these wonderful stories for, with hilarious results. And then he would say, and now it's sketch time. <laughs> and they would play in uh, yes. a bunch of sketches and a bunch of quickies. And I submitted a few quickies ah, lo and behold god they bought one they actually bought one of my quickies oh, what do you remember what it was i do dave allen was blasphemous in every possible way yeah but he treated all religions with equal contempt so uh he matched every catholic anti-catholic sketch and i think he was a catholic with an anti uh, church of england sketch with an anti-jewish sketch so it, it was it was very equal <laughs> My sketch uh, was a, a silent, or silent because it got no laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> um, it was a silent quickie and it involved a congregation uh, in a Church of England church and the, the church warden passing around the collection plate. Now, yeah, I think you've got to try and uh, try imagine this. I, I'm not going to tell it very well, but stick with me on this uh, and decide whether it's worth it or not. Um, passing around the, pl the collection plate. So he passed the, the empty collection plate to the first row of, of the congregation. They passed along, put their money on the collection plate, passed him back the plate, nice pile of notes. Oh, very good. Next row, bigger pile of notes. The third row, when he gets the collection plate back, less notes. The fourth row gets an empty collection plate back. Gives it to the fifth row, doesn't get the collection plate back, <laughs> but gets a chipped enamel mug. <laughs> well, for some extraordinary reason, that, uh, that tickled the fancy of Dave Allen and his, his two script editors. And I was really fortunate enough to get that broadcast. Mm. Oddly enough, as yet, it, it hasn't actually turned up in the, in the best of Dave Allen DVDs. <laughs> and from the way I've described it, you can probably tell why. No, it's a, it's a lovely, it's a sight gag, isn't it? It's a sight gag. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's all, all kinds of hidden meaning if you, if you want to uh, go into the depths of the subtext, which I didn't realise at the time, yeah. of, of, of theft in church. Yeah. But, but so that, that was my first on air. We can talk philosophy. <laughs> That's fine. Oh, go, you go ahead. I'll go for a cup of tea. No. <laughs> that was my first on air piece of scripted material. Wow. Uh, and that was a great Philip. That was a, a, a good boost. So you're sitting at home here in your flat, Castle Rise, 17 yeah. years old. Cranking out jokes. Mum and Dad probably watching TV with you? Sure. And what do they think? That the, the little Colin has got something on Dave Allen. Yeah. What, they, do they, what do they say? They couldn't understand it, really. They couldn't quite understand the concept, to be truthful, Peter. My dad was a plumber. Yeah. My mum was a school dinner lady. So they had no in background, an interest in show business because oh. they used to watch comedians and laugh at them. But they had no background in show business at all. You know, we were, came from a, I came from a very blue-collar, working-class background. And, and to go into... Uh, to meet stars and, and turns, off yeah. tel or turns off the telly, yeah. that was a, a whole new world with which they had no aspirations, knowledge, or could identify with. Wow. And the fact that I was doing this, <laughs> I think they were, they were pleased. I think they were frightened for me because they had no idea... In, 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 into the world you were going. Exactly. But if you could, did you feel like if you could make your parents laugh, then you could hit Middle England in the Y fronts, as it were? I guess. Do you know I didn't try my stuff out on my parents? But surely they would, they would see the results on... Did you ever watch your own material with your parents? Yes. How was that? Uh, that was, I must admit that was quite nice because they were proud. Okay, they were well, very proud. Go. And they were very proud when, in the early days, my name rolled up at yeah. the end of a show. And when you get your first, oh, when you get your first 100. Like it, it? Oh, it's, it's a amazing. wonderful thing. It's like having your first book published. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, yeah, ab yes, that's exactly right. And so, uh, based on this tentative success, I was really inspired to think, yeah, maybe, maybe I can do this. Your attention, please. This is an insecurity announcement. Here at Latopia Daily and Latopia After Dark, we're feeling, well, a little bit insecure. But you can help. For the cost of a cappuccino a week, 
you can help us stay on the air. Just click on the Support Us link on the website and donate what you can. Thank you. We're already feeling more secure. I'm curious as to how you would write for something like Family Fortunes or Family Feud, as we call it in the States, because it seems so off the cuff. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that, that could be true of lots of um, apparently ad-lib type shows. Absolutely. Well, certainly on Family Fortunes, uh, what Bob Monkhouse liked to do was, was stuff the fabric of the show with what he called funny putty. I'm a comedian, right. so I, I'm, I'm going to run the show as best I can, but I'm also going to try and get my laughs. Right, yeah, he's <laughs> so, repartee. Yeah. Uh, so, Ian Wynn, introduce it to your family. So, Ian, you right. would introduce your mum, your grandmother. my agoraphobic aunt. Yeah. Exactly. That. And so, Bob Monkhouse would be armed with a joke about your agoraphobic aunt. Now, would you interview the family beforehand? No, that was that was. Or you just gave him like, if they say plumber, thankfully no. my father is a plumber, so I've got tons of those. <laughs> yeah. No, mercifully it was more precise. All the families were interviewed by contestant researchers for their um, areas of interest, what their hobbies were, what they did for a living. So we were then armed with the the writers, and there were two other very very skilled, experienced writers on the show. A man called Spike Mullins, who was a genius. Another man called. Uh, Phil Parsons, who was ever so good too. So we would be armed with um, the professions of the family so we could confect our jokes based on the information we were given. Oh, I could never be trusted with that kind of power. <laughs> hats off to you, sir. Yes, hats off to you. So we would write jokes about Ian's bald head, about his agoraphobic aunt. Right. And Bob would go through the jokes. But and not about the incest or the... The, the granny under the floorboards. None of the none of the families that that ever appeared on the two series of Family that Fortunes that I, they never mentioned it. Mm. Oddly, mm. and by the the jokes we could have written about that. You know, <laughs> maybe <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> um, comedians, and you, my goodness, you've you've known many many comedians. They're not always nice people, are they? No, they're not. No, I was very fortunate. Uh, the first comedian I met was Bob Monkhouse, mm. who was a charming, thoroughly decent man. Um, much maligned. Much maligned. Why, why is that? I mean, look, let's just say I think that probably he's the person who you've had the longest relationship with. Is, he? is, that, is that right? Oh, absolutely. And I, you knew him the best of all of everybody you've worked yeah, with. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, so what, what is it about Bob Monkhouse that made him maligned? Um... Because he was the consummate professional mm. and because he'd been doing the job a very, very long time, which meant that his influences in the 1950s were very much the American comics. He sounds very much, um, because I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I hadn't heard of Bob Monkhouse before we c came on the show. I thought I should bone up, so I watched some videos um, on, on this thing called the YouTube. Anyways, uh, <laughs> the, kid, the kids are all hot on it. And he sounded very much like the Adirondack uh, borscht belt comedian, upstate New York, yeah. hat skills kind of kind of thing. Uh, you know, just flew in from Vegas. My arms tired. Blah blah blah. I mean, there was one there, and there are some there are some there are some good jokes. And he does, um, you know, that it, that is a stream of sort of cruise ship comedy that works for a certain audience. Yeah. And at the time when people ha didn't have comedy, like you threw them funny, and they were it was hilarious because they hadn't heard it. Yes. And he was taking the piss out of what were then sort of sacred subjects. I think people have a harder time today because these kinds of things have been done. That ground was broken. You can't be the Beatles anymore. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, and because Bob was a, an avaricious hoarder of, of information, he really liked the way the American comics at that time worked. He liked their slickness. He Who liked are we talking? Their Lenny Bruce, Bob Newhart. Oh, all of those. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. but his influences were came in from every angle. He loved every angle of comedy. He was. He seemed to me to be a sponge. Actually, he, oh, he would just absorb, wouldn't he? Absolutely. Mm. With with the mental capacity to retain as mm. well. When mm. you say absorb, do you mean plagiarize? No. <laughs> <laughs> there was a long pause there. Yeah, no. There was a long pause. Don't no. edit that out. No, <laughs> I'll, 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 tell you, I'll tell you why I took a brief hesitation. What he did do, Ian, was to write the jokes down and analyse them. Mm. Okay, how are you doing this joke? How are you... Well, what's your laugh point? And he would learn from analysing the material on the page. 
So if writing down someone else's joke is plagiarism, okay, then he's a plagiarist. But he didn't re recite, um, um, recite those jokes per se. Yeah. No, so so that, that, maybe that's a harsh criticism. No, to, I, to I noticed on one where he said, uh, he was talking about fear of, uh, people say they have a fear of flying, and the joke is, you know, you don't have a fear of flying, you have a fear of crashing. But mm -hmm. him is, you, you don't have a fear of flying, you have a fear of not flying, of being in the air and suddenly not flying. And it's yes. the same joke, it's reworked, and it's, it's twisted up, and if people haven't heard it before, if you've brought it over the pond, yeah. and it's fresh enough, that flies. And that's been a part of comedy for... Yeah. You know, since I fell off my dinosaur and broke my wooden underwear. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. Um, yes, it was an influence, and because that was such an influence in his early life, that got into his kind of comedy DNA. That are. slick performance got into his DNA. He was slick. Yeah, and I don't think he could shake that off. And he was performing into a time when that slickness wasn't necessarily appreciated. Mm. Why? I think because performers uh, were a little more raw. They weren't quite as polished. We're talking, uh, we're talking about the growth of alternative comedy, aren't we? Yes. Stand-up. Yes, for sure. Um, so... He, well, he could do stand up. Well, that's, that's, that's it. You, you're saying that he was, he was pilloried for being raw? No, I think I, I think he, I'm saying he's, he was pilloried for being slick, yeah, for being slick, too polished. Awesome. Yes, awesome. I could see that. I could definitely, I, c I could definitely see where people would would go with that, and that I think was my knee jerk reaction. Being a great fan of alternative comedy, where it's just real jaggedy and sends people in different directions, and yeah. if it hits your funny bone, fantastic. But he was appealing to a broad audience. When I asked my wife, who's from uh, Northern England, uh, she, you know, around near Liverpool, and she said. My nan loved Bob Monkhouse. Yeah, yeah. So, and there's there's where we're we're hitting. I think the only comedian who's really playing to that crowd today, and agree, tell me if you agree, would be Peter Kay. Oh, absolutely. Peter Kay is is the epitome of that that kind of comedian. So you see him as, as following in Bob Monkhouse's footsteps more than anybody else on the circuit. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Maybe Peter might t have a different view on that, but so um, he's not in studio. <laughs> <laughs> but but. Bob was extraordinary, you know. Um, we wanted to talk about philosophy and the psychology of the comedian. Immanuel oh, Kant boy. called humour the collapse of a failed expectation. And I think what Monkhouse was doing, very much so, as, um, as a gag merchant, is how he would be described as what type of comedy does he do today. He, you know, he sets up punchlines and he tells them. He sets up an expectation and he takes it a different way. Yeah. And he does that continuously and manages to string it out over an hour, which is very difficult. Sure, absolutely. And that's the important, you said the important word, get laughs. Um, that's two words. I said, laughs. <laughs> that's my name. Oh, pedantic. Yeah, How do you spell that? Well, we do with this I have to, live, I have to live with him. Hey, you're the one, really? When am I moving in? Mm. I got my boxes outside. It's going to start raining. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Blowing, I, I, I was listening to an interview um, about 12 years ago uh, with John Lloyd, who's a brilliant television producer, yeah. one of uh, the cornerstone of, of British comedy for spitting so image many for years. One. Yeah, responsible for spitting image for Blackadder. Oh, yeah. And uh, John Lloyd, oh, master, might a genius, was asked by the interviewer um, about producing shows. And he said, you know, when we, we were... When the boys were writing Blackadder, we would look at a Blackadder script and we would say, how can we make that bit funnier? How can we make that line funnier? We would address every word. Is, is this, can we make this funny? Can, is this funny? Is this funny? Question every line. And I, I mentioned this to Bob and he said, you know, that's the difference between me and them. And I said, well, what do, you, what do you mean? And he said, well, they were looking for funny. Is this funny? I, when I read a joke... My gut reaction is, will this get a laugh? Mm. And there's a difference. Mm. There's a huge difference. Because what a, what a comedian on stage or in a TV studio or wherever who's trying to get laughs, what he doesn't need is for the audience to nod in appreciation and turn to one another and say, yes, that's wow, a that very, was very good clever. Point, a very good point, yes. <laughs> no, well, Mark, he's very clever, isn't he? Yes. But he does mean that a lot of alternative comedy, I mean, I'm going to sound like an old fart, really, but, you know, you know certain things will get a laugh. You, you know fart gags will get a laugh. You know willy gags will get a laugh and so on. And uh, I'll just get a bit bored. Yeah, sure. But, we're, but, but we're, what we're talking... I mean, we're back in the Y-fronts, aren't we? Well, this is what we're talking... It sounds to me like... 
it sounds to me like there's the type of comedian who who wants to make chips by cutting up that's uh, French fries to uh, my, my American <laughs> comrades. Yeah, if you want to make French fries, you have two choices. You can cut up a potato and fry it up, and those are you know those are pretty well delicious. Or you can go the Burger King route, and the Burger King route is the the recipe for making fries is thirty pages long. So they're doing almost molecular gastronomy. And people say, oh, but I love Burger King French fries. Yeah, because they're engineered that way at the molecular level. So when you have technicians who are like, okay, what is funny in the laboratory? It maybe doesn't come across as well as just like, here's some potatoes, man. They're good. So you think you're a technician, Colin? Yeah, more than, uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, you're, you're, yeah, well said, Peter. I I would claim I'm a a technician because I I look at a subject um, and come at it from various angles. Uh, um, use comedy technique in order to try and wring some fun from a, from a subject. How difficult is it for you to reliably, dependably, and obviously, again, going back to your CV, people totally depend on you. It's very clear that, you know, you've you, you got the creme de la creme and the best shows around um, coming to you. So obviously they feel you're very reliable, that, you know, if you want something sorted out, go to Colin. Mm-hmm. How difficult is it for you to consistently measure up creatively to to that i mean do you have off days do you have how off long weeks? is your recipe book ah oh, you poor boy oh you were in a culinary mood today <laughs> you're just hungry <laughs> i just haven't had anything eaten in a while oh yeah <laughs> let's hope you're after dark and you've not eaten yet no you've had no supper no they don't um, feed me unless it's decent so please sorry please. peter can you i, I was I just thinking about the creative pressure on you no to, yeah i mean people can spark great ideas great you know um Biggles flies and done fantastic, but you know we want ten gags by tomorrow morning, please. It's you know it becomes a job. It's a job, um, like working at the Ford factory or or working on a, a, a frozen pea processing plant. Rubbish. It's a job. Rubbish. No, this is emotional. This is the humor is is something that 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 transcends the mechanical processes. You're going into emotions, into thought. I disagree with that heartily, sir. Well, I, you know, I don't want to give myself airs. I but I always think if anyone can do it, if I if I can do it, anyone can do it. Well, and that's clearly, again clearly not that's true. Again, <laughs> clearly not true. I mean, it's, it's there is a, there is a technique and there are I'll take uh, someone who's who's quite popular now who I actually really like is Jimmy Carr. Oh, yeah. Jimmy Carr, uh, he is cut and polished. His, I mean, he doesn't have an eyebrow hair out of place, and he has a slick technique, but he gets laughs. Yes, absolutely. And that's and, and his material is, whoa, you know. There's great he, laughs for his tax evasion. Yeah, but he takes yeah. the piss out of that frequently. Does he? You know, yeah, he's absolutely He's, he's well advised to do that. No, it's say. and it, that's the only route. And the fact that he didn't clam, he's like, yeah, I got caught. And he makes a joke of it whenever it comes up. Mm. And I, I, you got to admire him for that. He's like, yeah, I tried to get away with it and I didn't. And so there's a tech, there's a technician hmm. who who gets laughs. Yeah. And there's there is a mis- there's a sprinkling of magic dust in what you do that is not like working in the Ford plant. I maybe yeah well okay have you sure. seen the Ford plant lately? But they're are... looking good. <laughs> but there are tricks. Looking at a a, a word, looking at a, a subject like the storm. You know, uh, we've we fought our way in into the Litopia studio tonight with the, the storm beckoning. So if uh, you were to say to me, could you write some jokes on the storm? So you know, okay, so I'd take myself in a in a quiet corner and write down the word storm. And look at the word storm. Now, okay, there's an X. There's an X-Men character called Storm. Can I get a joke about oh, th- with the storm coming in on me? Can I can I get a Halle Berry joke in there? Mm, okay, maybe. Uh, th- there's going to be trees falling down. Trees are falling down. Okay. Um, can I maybe I can get some wooden soap actor jokes in there? We both, the, the whole half the cast of EastEnders were blown down by the storm. Fantastic. Um, this is great. I'm just sort of spitballing the thought yeah. process. Um, um, oh, bl- yeah. Bl- okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, the storm, yes. My goodness me, boy, the, the storm really blew through London. Um, and suddenly I'm thinking, I can get, can I get a, a Hugh Grant joke in here? <laughs> blown, blown down in London. It's been blown. Blown down, and I didn't even, I didn't even know uh, D- Divine Brown was in London. Oh, and suddenly, right. Russell suddenly, Brand. So, suddenly there's a joke forming. Right. Coming right so, back to uh, Ian's weird introduction. Here, isn't it? <laughs> so you're probably it's inspired. Very yeah. disturbing. Right? So that's the kind of thought process that you go through. And you look at a subject until until little beads of perspiration appear on your forehead, and then maybe little little blobs of blood appear on your forehead. We just had a little masterclass, haven't we? Yeah, we have. Mm. And Pete, if you know, 
my 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 blowjob gag is it may it'll it'll grow on you. You just gotta roll it. So? You just gotta roll it around in your mouth. Feel it on your tongue, Thank and you. and and then on the on the ride home, you know, you'll yeah. you'll start laughing. Ian, did I did I just plagiarize your blowjob thought then? No, I don't think so. I think you were riffing. <laughs> I oh think, boy! I think you picked up a chord. All right, sir. All my right. young, my young kids, listening tonight. <laughs> Lucy and Mark. Lucy's twenty-one and Mark's seventeen. The fact that their old fogey dad uh, has been used in the same sentence as riffing. Wow! I'm going to go home with a, with a few brownie points tonight. Believe you so me. I, just, well, I sure hope. Pete, just yeah. back to Bob Monkhouse. Was he a nice person? Yes, he was. He was a charming man, and um, to know him was to love him. People, if you didn't like his TV persona, you thought he was oleaginous, and you thought he was too slick. You had to go and see him in cabaret, in live performance, and everyone who saw him in live performance was so impressed with his stage technique and his, his power. Uh, and his winning persona, and everyone who met him in person loved him. So he was like that off stage. He was absolutely. He, he did what was he like when he was under stress? When he was stressed? When he was saying, "No, Colin, that's not good enough. I don't want that." What was he like then? I never. Do you know? I'll be honest with you, Peter. I never saw him stressed. Mm-hmm. He was un- unflappable. Uh, and uh, I was shocked when sitting in a BBC dressing room uh, years and years ago, before doing a National Lottery Live, which was a a uh, 15-minute Saturday night show when the lottery was pretty much in its infancy. It had only been running a couple of years. Um, got, Bob got to host these these uh, Saturday night shows with a lottery live draw. And we were sitting in this BBC dressing room running through the opening monologue material, which was topical jokes culled from the, the headlines of, of, of that day's newspapers. Mm. And outside, the audience were queuing up to go in. And Bob said to me, Oh, there it goes. Because we heard the, the hum and the bubble of the audience outside. And he said, oh, there it goes. So I said, what goes? He said, every time I hear the audience for the first time, my stomach goes, eh. just a little bit, <laughs> but every time. Yeah. And that was, that again was a revelation because you think a performer of, of such experience and, yeah. and so many years of appearing in, in front of an audience, you'd think you'd be nerveless. But every no, crowd is different. Yeah. Every abs- crowd is different. You have no idea the way things are going to go. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not going to even aspire to uh, g- even climb the foothills of, of, uh, of these Himalayas uh, and the comics who perch, who perch at their summits. I did stand-up comedy for several months, and it is remains the most difficult, stressful, can't sleep kind of occupational be hazard, because you just don't know. Sometimes you get on stage and everybody's just in a good mood. They've had a drink. The weather's fine, and they just whatever you say, it doesn't matter. They're out there to have a good time. And then you go to the Edinburgh Festival, and everybody's queued up around the corner, and they've come to your show because everything's sold out, and they're looking at you like, "Make me laugh, monkey boy." Yeah. Mm. And that's a tough crowd in Scotland. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that, is that maybe why you weren't so comfortable getting on stage yourself? I think you've bashed it squarely, that nail squarely on the head. I, I couldn't have done what you've, what you've done. My admiration for you is, is increased tenfold. Okay, he's, he's saying that, but when he talks oh, he's about... Still, re- he was pretty low to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> the bar was pretty low there. Yes, yes, we start, we, start, we yeah. start in the gutter and work our way down here. But I would like to describe your motion when you talk about working on the QWERTY keyboard and being the writer behind it. Those finger motions don't strike me as typing, sir. They strike me as puppeteering. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a very good analogy. That's very nice. But I... But I I He's wiggle, doing it again. I I'm wiggle my fingers out. and my thumb as if I'm a touch typist, which I'm not. But I have I have been wedded to the QWERTY keyboard for forty odd years. You're a hunt and pecker. Yeah. Come closer to new worlds of storytelling and new stars in the making. Come closer to Radio Latopia. Who would you not want to write for again? Oh boy. Yeah. Um I, I was very fortunate to work for people that I liked. Anyone I didn't like, I dabbled with briefly and then either walked away or got fired. Uh, and I was grateful to be fired because I, did, I didn't much like that. That is company. a massive luxury. Yeah. Oh, boy. Dad. Name names. Um, I couldn't get on with Cilla Black. Really? Um, I did... I, I made the pilot of Blind Date. Wow. Uh, with... Uh, a very good northern comedian called Duncan Norvell. 
shot two pilots for Blind Date, mm. dating game. In was the that US. the one with the, um, the the bubble thought bubbles that appeared over people's heads as they were going on the date? Uh, maybe in the US, but not over here. It was huge. But it was dating yeah. dating game in the US. Was Blind Date, massive show. Yeah. Um, and uh, that in that television studio at London weekend, Duncan Norvell was marvellous. I've never known such an atmosphere. The dating game. It was the dating game, sure. Okay, there we are, with the three contestants yeah. on the one side of the screen, Absolutely. and then you yeah, ask the questions, and they're precisely. laden with innuendo, and yeah. then they yeah. pick one, and they that's go exactly out on, right. on a date. And my job with another writer was to write the innuendo for the, for the, for the punters. You. There we are. If they couldn't think of anything... Um, witty, witty off the cuff, um, and Duncan Norvell made a marvelous job of it. But he didn't land the job. Um, then they gave it to Cilla Black, mm. and I did the first series of six with Cilla Black, and it just didn't gel. Um, she's, she's got a reputation for being brittle. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I left the show after season one, saying to myself and probably to anyone who'd hear. Do you know, I, I left that show because I couldn't quite tune into Scylla's way of thinking. And, you know, that show's not going to run. Oh, boy, that's got the kiss of death written all over it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was wrong. <laughs> yeah, 16 <laughs> seasons later. Wow. <laughs> so, look, so bringing things up to date, because that was, gosh, it must be, I don't know, two or three decades at least there. Sure. Up to date now, there is this thing on uh, Channel 4, which I haven't seen because I don't have a TV license. I haven't got a television. I haven't got a television. I'm so uninterested in, in television. I'm much more interested in what's going on on the internet. But there's this, this show... He doesn't understand. have a television, folks, because of the air of superiority that hits you oh, like you think, a wave of incense being smug when here? you walk through the house. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, Channel 4 got this show called... I think it's called The here. Sex Box, right? Hmm. And two people have, have sex one of inside a box and then come out and discuss it with people outside. And I think... How low can you get, actually? Yeah, has it come I mean, to this? Oh, yeah. oh, easy. The camera goes into the box. I suppose that's the next thing. But, I mean, oh, am I just being an old fart? No, I, I, but I, I guess it's the way that, uh, that society's gone. Society's become more Do you tolerant. think it's society? Well, well but the producers and the commissioners figure that there's an audience for that. And I guess there is. Well, we were talking before the show started, Peter and I, about the diminishing audience of television, how you used to be, because there was, partially because there was, there was a dearth of choices, that you could get 20 million people to watch a show, because that was what there was. Now it's becoming fractured between, I mean, look at Hollywood's totally decimated into just doing kind of sequels and, and sequels of sequels and, and whatnot. And then you have uh, video games that are making more money than you know three times the Hollywood output and everything's moving electronic, there's YouTube. Now, in order to get a couple million people, you've got to scrape the bottom of the... Someone's got no, to scrape the No, I don't agree with that. I don't agree. And that is okay. really... Let, the, me, that, let, that, okay. let me rephrase. Someone will scrape the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, they inevitably will, and that's what I really don't like about it. I'm not being prude. I mean, if, if people want to watch... Other people having sex on TV, fine, go ahead. I'm not going to get in, in your way. Well, they are on the internet, you so uh, beloved. Yeah, apparently so. Yeah. Yes, you can find these things on there. But He's what, got what, six I, what I in really front of him, don't folks. like is these shows are made by intelligent people, very intelligent people, who are patronizing you and me because they think they're that's, technicians. They are technicians. They know how to yes. get an audience. Yes. They're not oh, concerned say, with that, it's, that it's, it's the it's voyeuristic. Me, it's unscrupulous and it's highly manipulative and I hate that. I don't like feeling like being used like, like that. A Channel 4, you know, the Spider Boy or the, you know, the, the co-joined, yeah, the yeah. Octopus Twins and this, yeah. you're like, why am, why has this become spectacle? And then they, you know, they jazz it up with doctors to make it look less like a, you know, a 19th century freak show. But they, as you say, are technicians, are, are you basically saying all they're doing is a logical extension of what Colin was doing? I'm saying that if there's a dollar to be made, people will be out there making that dollar, whether it's legal, illegal, whether it's grey, white. How far would you go, Colin? Oh, boy. I, um, I, I, what I don't like about comedy now, and I, I guess this is the, uh, uh, my way of addressing... Any sentence that starts like that defines you as an old fart. Addre address it. What I don't like about comedy now, Please. as an old fart, yeah. is the use of the swear word. The, ah. F, the F word is such an important part of, of comedy routines now. But what I object... I don't mind... I don't object to the use of the F word per se, but it it's when the audience is expected to laugh at the use of the F word rather than the punchline of the joke. Okay, mm -hmm. but it can certainly be used for spice. 
oh sure I witnessed the, the, the comedians uh, uh, the American comedians oh gosh Rick, Richard Pryor oh Richard Pryor was laden laden yeah absolutely but you weren't laughing at his use of the F word no, you were you laughing were, at what he was saying at what he was saying absolutely Billy Connolly we use the F word it's on the way it enhances the joke what I object to is is the audience laughing at a comedian saying the, announcing the F word and that's the point of the laugh that you know that's the yeah. best explosion of laughter they're laughing oh he said F oh that's funny and that for me is wrong. Okay, here I'm gonna. Here I'm. I'm afraid I'm gonna call you on Peter's old codger um, <laughs> jibe. Yeah, sure. My, yeah, sure. My, my father feels the same way in this, and he's 84. Uh, that I'm 72. Come on. All right. Uh, and you've, you've still got a long ways to go, as I as I discovered. You you don't have the bus pass yet, uh, so you, you're still uh, uh, quite quite healthy. In it in it for the long haul. He objects to anything that uses the F that where people drop the F bomb. Well, we do that a lot um, on the tape after dark. We do it, on, but the. Th- the thing is, is language is changing. It's not yeah. shocking to the new to the next generation. It's just a word in the same way that Shakespearean times, you know, you'd call someone a bastard, mm. or you know, the the way that the way that language is evolving and changing. That it's just not shocking as it w- back in the day, especially of early television. It was never said, but on the streets, it completely was and now that's kind of encroached television has changed you have the pay channels you have the the what, what do they call it here after nine o'clock the um the watershed the watershed mm. the watershed hours and i think in some veins i don't know how you feel about frankie boyle tom stayed uh jimmy carr is absolutely foul mouth chris rock is one of my favorites these guys drop drop it all the time yes indeed but they're they're smart comedians they then their material is smart and and their use of the f word is on the way to the punchline it yes. enhances it underscores certain points they want to make but it's not the punchline and the crowd isn't laughing oh we said f they're laughing at what's said after the f yeah. they're using the f word as as an adjective rather than a punchline and it I'm, can ex- it can accelerate a punchline if it's mm. if it's done if it's done properly but it doesn't sh- i feel just as a generation a generation past i feel it's less shocking to me than it is to my father and it's certainly less shocking to you know to to my godson in his 20s sure but i would contend ian that the that the audience is laughing with with certain comedians the audience is laughing at the fact that they said f because if you if you strip away are they yeah i think they are because if you strip strip away what else they've said it's not a terribly clever or witty joke but how do you, how do you feel about rich hall i like him very much i think he's a terrific operator He's because I, I I quite like him, but he will definitely, you know, I, and sometimes even me, I'll be like, all right, you didn't, you really didn't need to swear on that one. Yeah, but he's a t- what a what terrific performer, you know. In my, well, I don't mind the swearing. It's the fact that there's manipulation going on. Well, there's manipulation. If, 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 going if it doesn't on. seem genuine, I mean, I'm very aware of, of of you know of BS. I think if if I'm being manipulated, what does that like stand it. for? Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you've made, yeah, but the you've manipulation, made me say something but I'm that's, say- I, we have to flag this now you know what we in itunes because i get very fussy if you but use here's adult the, language but here's the thing so we'll this pass show the watershed. is now officially flagged we'll be pa- we'll be posting it's, ad, it's an adult show now oh, we've, another just, we've just gone into adults fantastic and that's, that's well, all right let's, that's let's right. get let's get pornographic let's well thank god it was the hosts and not not <laughs> not, not the guests oh you yeah but you're being you're being manipulated anyways. When when a comedian gets up, what gets to me personally, and I, I really enjoy stand-up comedy, partially because I've seen how bloody hard it is, yeah. is when someone gets up and has the kind of courage to put themselves out there and it's not going very well and then you know they, they can either win or lose an audience. It's more... I mean, it's 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 theater in its kind of purest form. It's just mm. a naked microphone, and people go up there and try to make you laugh. And what really disturbs me is when people get up and they do an airline joke. They're just like, yeah, this guy yeah. has just gone yes. too far. Here we go with the stewardess. And that, why? Because it's a shared common experience, and we're usually going on holiday, or maybe we're business travelers, and it's something that's a big thing that happens. We get in the tube, and we fly across the sky, and everybody's done it. And now, wasn't it funny we had to sit through the safety talk? And wasn't it great that then, then the meals were terrible? And this When Bob Monkhouse was in Bob Newhart was doing it you know, in the 60s and 70s, that was fresh, yo. But now it's like been, you know, and I see it start coming. I was on the plane. I was flying to the, and I just switch it. I can't, I cannot hear another gag on that, no matter yeah. how well it's constructed. Yes, certainly those, those routines have been, those 
minds have been well and truly dug out those particular areas and it's very hard for a for a comic to find a new area of uh, but to be funny about. But where people tell a story, where they're they're talking, like I think of Eddie Murphy's in Delirious, he's talking about the cookout, mm. you know, mm. it, where his, uh, you know, and he's describing all the members of his family. And it's hilarious. You know, it's his father gets up, I'm drunk. And if you don't like it, you get the fuck out. Like he makes the whole, and you're there, you're in his backyard, and it's you all have these crazy, crazy relatives and whatever. But it's unique when I see someone like Bill Hicks talking about the Gulf War, or or talking about rock and roll and how he wants his musicians to be on drugs. You know, they had to they had to get uh, Ringo off the ceiling with a rake to write Yellow Submarine. You know, you're you're there, you're like, "Yes. Yes." When you talk about when you see Chris Rock talking about, you know, you, they should make guns legal but bullets cost $5,000 a piece so that you you got to save up and get a bullet on layaway. When there's politics woven in, that's what attracts me to to comedy. And I think sometimes a lot of it gets reduced to a kind of formulaic, engineered process. And that's where I have, I think I have trouble with light entertainment. But maybe that's just me. I've been ranting. I'm sorry. Yeah, you but have ranted. But what I like about all those performers that you've mentioned is they're performers, they perform the jokes. They get into the characters, mm. and that is just a wonderful, wonderful technique. And I, I, I appreciate that enormously. It's, it's the joke announcers who say F for the sake of F effing. I, it's not who for would me. you like to have written for? Who would you like to write for now that, oh. that you haven't written for? Oh, I, I love Joan Rivers. And I, I love Joan Rivers because... Now there's of, a clean, <laughs> serene, wholesome... wholesome. Yes, <laughs> I love Joan Rivers because of her attack, because of her performance. She takes no prisoners and she gives it all. She makes the audience have it. I love that attack. She tears herself open, yeah. Oh, absolutely. She's terrific. You know, I like Leno. I like Leno because he, because of his, his technique. I just... Um, you talk about manipulating an audience. Boy. Um, he, boy, he can. He can... He can get them applauding by applauding first. Yeah. I, it's just extraordinary <laughs> technique that he's got. But, I also, but he plays to a certain crowd. He plays to a certain crowd. I'd like to have had a, a try at writing for, for Leonard. You, from, from a, a, for a British writer to try and break into that American uh, market is very, very tough. I think it'd be impossible. really tough for someone like, I don't know how Monkhouse did in the, in the States, but he I didn't. Look, well, yeah, he, I'm surprised. Well, I think he could, he could well, have done Vegas, I see. In, in the videos that I watched online on the Google machine, um, I looked at his audience, and the audience was all white, middle class, well-dressed, yeah. bouffant hair, and that is a rapidly diminishing audience in the United States. And I'd put it to you that, the, that some of the best comics in the States play, play the whole culture. They, they talk about the black experience, the Hispanic experience, experience the the immigrant experience and the the kind of adirondack catskill uh gag merchant comedian was for a certain time and now you've got to play to, to a multicultural audience you look at omid dajili or yes. shafi korsandi yeah. and you know these are people who i, I mean omid dajili is hilarious he's what is his, his line um uh, you know, I'm the only Irani Iranian comic, uh, which is three more than Germany. Yeah. So, you know, it's you. you yeah. He's playing different cultures off, off each other, and then he he adopts a posh English voice, and then he goes into the uh, into the belly dance, and it's those kinds of comedians that are cutting edge now because the middle ground has been, as you said, it's been a mine that's that's been ex yeah. that's been well and truly dug. Another. Uh, uh Comedy performer from the US that I, I hugely admire is is, um, is Wanda Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh boy, I think she's sensational. Scathing. Yeah. Oh boy, I think she's wonderful. She makes. Oh, didn't she? Did she do? You'll know this, Ian. Oh God, did I hope she? So. Yeah, you will. No, you'll know this. Did she do President Obama's inaugural White uh, White House press correspondence dinner? They're, 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 uh, when the president's elected, they they, throw, they oh yeah the press, yeah yeah absolutely yeah, you know the, what I'm talking yeah, about the, um, the, the press dinner the um, yeah it'll come to me and we'll dub it in later yeah she press um, correspondence oh, yeah. dinner yeah that's exactly right and 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 Leno uh, did some jokes President Obama got up and did some terrific jokes. oh he ripped on he, he took it to Donald Trump oh, that was oh my president's making jokes at the same time he's droning people it, it was extraordinary 
bizarre. But he was getting well, he big laughs. Well, he did make drone strikes because it was, he did, a, it was he a, made drone jokes. He did not make drone jokes. He did. It's a bit soon. He was getting he was getting big laughs after his inauguration. And I think, you know, there was a honeymoon period where the, the crowd could forgive him. And also, bear in mind, he was the first black president. So there's a huge love affair, waves of affection going towards him. And a lot and, of assault rifles. And the Sykes. Rifles. <laughs> but, you know, Wanda Sykes got up and she said, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I never thought I'd be standing here, ladies and gentlemen, to say that we have a black president. And, of course, the crowd went mad. They applauded. And she said, um, forgive me, because I'm going to paraphrase it. I might get it wrong. She said something like, mind you, she turned to the president and said, if you screw up, we're all going to be saying, what's the half-white guy think he's doing? <laughs> Who voted for the mulatto? <laughs> and you, only Wanda Sykes can say that. Right, right, right. Yes. And everybody hooted with laughter. Yeah. It, took, it took enormous chutzpah to do yes. that joke. But it's yes, a terrific absolutely. joke. Yes. Wow. What a moment that would have been. Um, I've got to ask you about this. A lot of these names um, are icons from my childhood and teen years. And it seems to me that, um, uh, probably, I don't know whether they're people you've actually written for, but it does seem to me now as if a lot of them from that generation, (laughs) rather sadly, are being, what should we say, investigated rather closely by the police at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Those who aren't dead yeah. are, are looking at the... We need to explain this to non-UK listeners. Uh, it was the Jimmy Savile scandal, really, I suppose, that broke the whole thing wide open. It turned, turned out Jimmy Savile, national icon, national treasure, and decorated really by the Queen. And really weird-looking dude, folks. Very weird-looking dude. <laughs> uh, turned out to be a serial <laughs> paedophile, and the BBC was effectively his enabler. Did you ever come across Savile? I met him. No, I didn't meet him at all. My wife, who's a, a television vision mixer, which is a switcher in the yeah. US, um, she used to work on Jim Will Fix It, uh, and um, although she never encountered him per se because she was always in the box and he was always in the studio. And when I was, was when I was box. pursuing Catherine uh, around the corridors of the, of the of the television centre with love on my mind, um, I went along to one of the Jimmy uh, Jim Will Fix It shows mm. um, and sat in the audience. At the back, and this was, Jim will fix it. Was a, a wish fulfillment show. Oh yeah, we're. I, I th- I'd like to think that my that my fellow Americans are are aware of aware okay. of this. Children would write in with a sort of a make a wish, and he would he would say yes, and they'd get a chicken in the mail or what. what exactly what have you. so. Yeah. And my only encounter with Savile was during a and a, he abused some a break in, people. in taping. Children. He stomped up the stairs with with a, a big cigar burning in his suit looked at me and said, morning. And I said, so I said, morning. And he turned back, went down the stairs again. That was my only encounter with Jimmy Savile. Did it creep you out? Oh, but I lost sleep for days after that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, oh boy, it was like Mike Myers in a horror film. It was, it was extraordinary. It was an unnerving experience. What's, what's Colin, what's Colin, wake up. <laughs> Jimmy Savile's coming to get me. What, it, Colin, what's going on? Oh, it's, it's hard to know. Quite frankly, I just don't understand it. Um, I, I, I'm really at a loss for words, as is most of show business. Um, not quite certain why the police police are pursuing this particular um, these particular lines of inquiry. Well, Sir Terry Wogan, who you worked for for twenty years, a oh, splendid fellow. Yeah, uh, he, he went off on. On Jimmy Savile, he wrote an absolute scathing, he gave absolutely scathing commentary on what a creepy dude he was, how he was toxic to the whole BBC environment, and uh, it's it's actually great. Right? Everyone is saying this after, after the event, though, no, aren't it's, they? It's, they are all no, saying, oh, I knew he was a wrong one. But to have someone of his stature publicly condemn him was great, but at the same time, he, he, admi- should, have, he should have said something at the time. At the he? same time, he admitted that rumours were rife at the uh, at the BBC of Jimmy Savile, who was barred from participating in Wogan's main what he's what he's known for, which is a children in need um, sort of telethon, uh, getting money for charity for children in need. And the BBC, even though they had no proof, were like, "Yeah, he's kind of creepy. Let's keep him away from this one," even though there was no proof. And uh, Sir Terry Wogan had heard the rumors, like many people had. Why? Why do you think th- that it was just rumors that no one investigated further at the time? I, I think if if you worked at Television Centre at that time, you'd heard the rumors. I'd heard the rumors, but because one had no evidence per se, you didn't see what was going on. You just, it was hearsay. Oh, Jimmy Savage, you know he does that. Oh, 
Really? Oh, boy. Oh, okay. Nobody goes to the police. Well, you know, I, I had this Nobody disc- has a, a niece, that, you know. Yeah. That, but that's the thing. Uh, we heard the rumours, but we had no evidence to back it up. But surely the, the people who were abused would have been in a position to say, actually, no, this is wrong. He's... he's but they won't, they won't believe, will they? That's the essence of, you know, of the, I, the situation. But this is how the rumours get started, surely. Yeah, absolutely. It's not from him. It's from people catching, you know, people seeing him in suspicious circumstances. Yes, absolutely. Do you think, I mean, I'm, I'm going to advance my theory here and see how you agree with it. I mean, I think to some extent the, these people are being pilloried. I don't mean Savile, who clearly was, you know, a disgusting creep. But it seems to me that there's sort of, you know, let's, let's go for the celebs and sometimes you get... You Cast get, a wide net. You get the police putting out a press release, you know, clear saying, that in the next six months we are going to be arresting six more celebrities. Stay tuned and see who we get this time. And it, I just think to myself, is, is there a little bit of distraction going on here? Is, the is the it, way the police call the press before they make an yeah, arrest. Yeah. Well, that's, and you this get is the Perp Walk, which happens very close to here, actually, outside Westminster mm. Magistrates Court. Well, this is oh, where I, I wonder if it's not masking something deeper in society that they don't want us to look at, like politicians, for example. But this is all speculative, and that's it what is. makes it so hard. And yeah. when the police cast such a wide net, you're going to get bycatch. Do you suppose... That was an oceanographic reference, folks. Bycatch. I don't know that expression. Ooh, bycatch. Uh, may, may I marine biologize? No, we'll, we'll say that for another show. Sorry. We're not going to get marine biology. <laughs> <laughs> by catch, just, by catch is, when they, is when you can only fish for tuna and you throw oh, your net oh, up and you, catch a whole bunch, and you catch a whole bunch of fish and you can only keep the tuna. You have to throw out everything. You have to throw out the sturgeon. You have to throw out the, the mackerel, the pollock. All that has to go over the side. You cannot even feed it to your own crew. And it's one of the things that is going drastically wrong with the earth which At we will, will address in a future time, show. Time which we'll address in a future show. Will. Bycatch. Yeah. Make a note of it, as you were. Thank you. Thank you. Ten jokes on bycatch by the end of the show. Yes, oh, you yeah. probably could do it. As Thanks, well. guys. Oh, really? All right. <laughs> no, no. So All what's? Right. I mean, what, what are you doing at the moment? Are you? Do you feel you've you've done it now? Or? Yeah. Do you know? Because but, uh, let's be honest, Peter. Um, most of the performers for whom I worked are either dead or in the swan song of their careers. Um, and the new performers coming through don't need a service industry like me. Don't they? Because all the comics, all the comedians, all the stand-ups now write their own material. How, and they, how, what, why is that? How easy is that for them to do? For stand-ups, I mean, there's certainly there are shows like, I don't know, Family Guy, The Simpsons, that kind of They have tons of writers. <laughs> they do indeed. Um, they, we don't have those kind of shows in the UK. No, we don't. We, we have panel shows which require... Right. Um, wit. Wit. Um, uh, they are serviced by, by comedy writers. When I first started, there were, oh, scores and scores and scores of people writing jokes for an awful lot of shows. Mm. Now, over the years, it's erosion. Jeez. The, 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 maybe there's a, do you know, there's a, I reckon there's a dozen comedy writers who are used on Blimey. the entertainment shows That's now. That's extraordinary. Yeah, because the shows aren't being made, which require... Uh, Oh. service from a, a joke writer per se. Well, the same tsunami that's hit publishing is, has hit your industry too. Oh, absolutely. I'm e- I'm effe- I sit here before you gentlemen effectively redundant. Um, and, you know, for, for two or three years, when the I always felt the wheels were going to fall off. You know, and if you, as a freelance writer, you, you, you work... You have to work with the knowledge that one day the wheels are going to fall off, and sure. it could be the, could be tomorrow, could be next year, but it's going to happen. Thank God for that bus pass. Yeah, looming large, but oh boy, another seven years to go. Boy, it cost us. Do you know how much it cost us to get here today? Hey, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, getting um, into difficult territory here. Uh, so, 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 moving on quickly. So, your advice then. So, um, you know, so, you know, there is a 17-year-old listening to the show even now who's got a burning desire to write that definitive, iconic, um, you know... Um, they've been sending gags to Jimmy they, Carr exactly, since they were 12. Yeah. So what, what's their best routine? I think you've got to stand, not do what I did. I think you've got to get there and do your own stuff because it's the only way to get your stuff on. Got to do your own stuff. No, I that's really, that's I really, really difficult. Believe I mean, that. Yeah. Because for singers... They certainly have their songs written. Mm. You know, very oh, few yeah. singer-songwriters out there anymore. But with comedy, it's they're, they're becoming... Everybody's doing their own thing. Is that because of the individual nature of comedy? Is it because we want to see more things that are 
uh, authentic. We know that what's coming that that they're not being lip synced or no, I, or I, because the shows are less scripted now. I believe that the the performers have more confidence in their own material, and once they get last with their own material, they stick with it. Michael McIntyre knows exactly what's going to work for him, so he doesn't need to buy in other material. Uh, Bob Monkhouse wrote his own material, but what I did as a service industry, was to augment his material with my jokes. Uh. I want every word that Bob Monkhouse said didn't come from my pen or from these waggling fingers on the QWERTY keyboard. Uh, he wrote an awful lot of stuff himself. But what I did in serving, servicing him with comedy material was buy him time. I, I bought him another angle on, on a subject. Mm. He came from a very middle-class, wealthy background. I came from a more of a, a rough ragas end background so i had a different perspective on certain subjects which i think he required for to address his, his, yeah. his broad his crossover. other white people yeah. you, you know what I'm, <laughs> i guess you get, i think you know what i'm saying yeah yeah for sure. um and i think now a, a comedy writer oh boy the opportunities were so great in my time uh, in, in my in my time, lads. Well, it was it was an open frontier. It was. Do you know the BBC in the nineteen seventies, the Light Entertainment Department of the BBC would actually send out a circular, a Roneoed or Xeroxed, to use nice quaint old expressions, um, a schedule of sh entertainment shows that were coming up. This year, we're planning to do another series of the two Ronnies. These are the kind of jokes we require. These are the kind of the sketches we require. We're doing another series of Silla Black. We're doing another series of the Cliff Richard Show. We're doing another series of the two um, uh, uh, other shows that they did. And they would invite everybody who had written some jokes in the past, who had tried to write jokes in the past for them, to submit material. And three script editors, some very, three very clever men, men like Austin Steele and Peter Vincent and Peter Robinson at the BBC Television Centre, would invite material. Which meant, to be truthful, gentlemen, that if you were sitting in your kitchen in the 1970s, waiting for the time to pass to pick up the kids, you could pick up a pen and scribble a few jokes, stick them in an envelope and send them off to the two Ronnies. And certainly if the material was good enough, you'd get your joke on the two Ronnies. Wow. And you could do that before you went along to pick the kids up from school wow. and come back to cook their tea. Yeah. So now you're saying the cream no longer rises. Absolutely not. There's no, there are no opportunities for writers, new writers coming through. And it's a, it's a great shame because there's a lot of talent out yes, there. It's, it's a tragedy. For, uh, also, yeah, go ahead. I think a lot of, uh, you know, obviously a lot of this is dated. Um, no one's got to say that. But there again, I, I've got a mate who's got two very young daughters. We're just talking about, you know, what do they like to watch these days? Because I don't have a TV set. And, you know, the answer that he gave will absolutely surprise you, but maybe not surprise you enormously, Colin. And he said, well, what they really like is all gas and gators. I said, what? That was a shame from my youth. Yeah. It's all gas and gators. You know. I thought you said orgasm gators. <laughs> Yes, yes, you probably did. But the these, these, these things are available now, again, on the BBC iPlayer. Oh. And it's so interesting, isn't it? That although there is an element of dating, there's still good writing and great comedy still stands up. Mark Edmonds was 15 when I introduced him to Round the Horn when it came out on CD. Yeah. And we used to, um, and Lucy will, will, and my wife Catherine will bear this out, we used to play Round the Horn in the car all the time, and Mark would hoot with laughter brilliant stuff uh, oh and rambling Sid Rumpole he'd yes. quote rambling Sid Rumpole yes. and hello I'm Julian this is my friend Sandy oh hello Mr Orn any bold yeah and and, and oh, gosh I was doing those gay voices long before I knew gay yeah, people existed exactly. That's but right. it, it was just very funny yeah. and those shows really do stand the test of time yeah I think so yeah. I do have a question I do have a question here. Uh, bec to bring this current um, you were famously uh, given Bob Monkhouse's gag book Yes. From his will. Yes, that that's he right. deeded everything to his daughter, I believe, and then you were the recipient of, t specially marked out, no inheritance tax, of t is mentioned spiral bound notebooks of Bob Monkhouse's gag books that he wanted to pass on to you, which I, I, must, I assume for you, sir, is a great honor, but I have to ask give us a gag from the book. Oh, boy. In which case, then, uh, do you know, gentlemen? I wondered if this might happen, and I happened to have brought this one of the one of the terms along. So, you Luke, brought, you brought along. Could you could you open up that briefcase for me? It's, it, it's in the zippy bit. The briefcase it's is a huge, big oh, black. The briefcase is unzipped, and suddenly light I'm just from between the zippers. I thought you were going to move in when you came. 
That's extraordinary. Yeah. It's, it's about to come out. It's a very, very big black briefcase. He's whipping out... Oh, I just don't want to know if it was. It might be a bit more of life support looks. equipment or something. And they'll flap open. There we go. And out comes one of the tomes. Oh, this. <laughs> We're in the presence of comedy so history. How would you folks. describe this? It's a very uh, well thumbed big, big it's a, book. It's a battered working tool yeah. of a of a working comedian. Um, it looks like it was harvested from the uh, the great library of Alexandria as it was burning. It's, it's, it's rather like the book of it's like the book of Kells. And uh, brief history. Two oh, Kells is a man who told me the blowjob joke. <laughs> oh, I knew we'd get back to that. <laughs> Jesus. Start as you mean to carry on. No, it's the thing. They these books went with Bob everywhere. So, for example, uh, if let me describe them. Okay, they are battered. Uh, it's got a, how big would you say that is? It's about two inches thick. It's bigger than A4. It's got bigger than A4. It's old full scap size actually, and it's an old twin lock file. Uh, inside, it's got Bob Monkhouse, Claridge's, Eggington, Leighton Buzzard, where he used to live before he died. And there are index tabs A through to Z on the right-hand side. It's as big as a breeze block, folks. It, it, it's extraordinary. And if I open just one page and let you have a quick glance at that... Okay, looking at the writing, this man was insane. <laughs> <laughs> it's all multicolored. It's multicolored. It's, it's red and it's blue and it's... Canada. It's gone. And as you flip the pages, do the letters become numbers and then, it, and then squiggles <laughs> yes, and then does. just, just <laughs> kill, 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 kill? Yeah. The reason, the reason for the different colours for each for each um, joke was for ease of identification. Oh, right. Really? So you know, uh, uh, what colours? We start with black, then we go green, then we go red. Are, are these the racism material that we're doing? No, oddly, uh, here's um, uh, closings uh, under under C. Yeah. We have closings, children's shows, conceit, cooking. Go go further. Um, <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Crime. Crime. Just shut up. Keep your mind Almost. out of the childhood. Oh. Ooh. Christmas. Christmas. Clothes. Uh, oh, and there are a whole oh, bunch bit of time. jokes uh, based on, on these particular subjects. So pick, that... Pick one. If, oh, okay. oh. Not children. Mm. <laughs> Probably not children, considering what we've been talking about. <clears throat> now, bear in mind, these jokes were written... <clears throat> oh, gosh, if Bob's been dead ten years, some of these jokes will be... 20 years old, possibly 25 years old. Under cooking, there's <clears throat> a beautiful illustration of a, of a saucepan boiling over and a hand, a cartoon hand holding that saucepan and there's smoke rising and there's custard coming over the side of the saucepan. And that's just the illustration uh, under the word cooking. Uh, I've bought my wife the biggest microwave oven I could get, a huge thing. I've told her it's a sunbed. That's, th that's that joke. That's 25 years old, that joke. Uh, she puts lemon pledge on the meat to give it a shine. We have a dog that sits up and begs not to eat. <laughs> I like that. We, we, I'm sure you can recycle that in, can't you? <laughs> you, you can press that into service. Yeah, I'm sure. Sure. I mean, yes. yeah I'm, I'm sure. He, he described someone in one of the shows I watched as being wolf, wolf ugly, where you, you wake up next to her and you chew your own arm off. Yes, you have to chew your own arm. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Yes, uh, I'm still on seas. I'm looking at jokes about cars and charity. This is extraordinary. It's it it is an extraordinary yes. tome. A lot of the material, truthfully, you know, because it's now so old, that doesn't necessarily stand the test of time. But well, for for its era, I mean, this is this is white bread. This is yeah. this is nourishment. This and is you know, the the mana of the. It, it doesn't. It this is not. Uh, this is not uh, a pickle with... Uh, yeah, there are lots of drawings, too. He's there are lots, lots of drawings. There. Lots, lots, of, lots of cartoons. Yeah. And really on the food thing. It's, I suppose it, it it's, has more historical significance yeah. now than, than yeah. maybe comedic significance. And I guess one day I'll pass on to my children and one day they'll put into a, a, an entertainment museum. Yes. And well, people, I think, well, I think it's a great shame that uh, comedy writing, as we've discovered tonight... Uh, from from Colin that that it's really on the way out because some people do not have the the courage to perform or it's not in their nature but they have the ability to write the ability to make people laugh I think Pete that also crosses over into publishing uh, you've just described a typical writer you most have writers to, cannot perform they, their own material people, they, can't do it. they sit inside most of the time and they write and that they're introverted personalities right. and we're moving into a culture where if you're not an extrovert you're not you don't even have a chance of succeeding in any of these sort of entertainment industries unless you can actually put your face forward 
and and start shouting in a microphone. And that's a disturbing place to be because the introverts of the world are probably, you know, kinder and gentler. Um, and we need him. And we stand, need, up, stand up. Hey, yourself, you introverts. in the corner, get up and tell us a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get on the dance floor. Yeah, some people can do it, and most of us can't. Colin, what a pleasure this has been. Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd be flattered to be invited to come along to Litopia After Dark. I'm a huge fan of your of your uh, work, and boy, I've followed in some illustrious footsteps. And, and when we spoke the other day, Peter, and you invited me along, um, I was immensely flattered. Thank you very much. The, the fact that two people could be interested in anything that I've got to say uh, is... is, is I think you'll find there have been millions and millions I over the years. So. The so this whole self-deprecation well. thing is yes. not playing very well in this <laughs> room, sir. I saw, saw this out, Colin. I, some serious therapy. You need a better closer. <laughs> well, I, but my closer would be uh, my performance technique is so rotten. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a terrible reader out aloud. In fact, both my children would pretend to be asleep when they were when they were very very young, so that I wouldn't have to read them oh, a, a bedtime, bedtime story. story. Because it was so lousy, and I'm such a rotten reader, and um, and you know, I'm very very happy to let people stand on stage and get the acclaim with anything that I might have helped them uh, perform. Well, to all you listeners out there who are currently pretending to be asleep, we know. Yes, <laughs> we know. <laughs> well, you. thank you very much. We didn't get to uh, we didn't get to uh, asking you to finish the sentence. Your mother's so fat that, but I think that's probably a good thing. <laughs> Uh, this has been Latopia After Dark. I'm Ian Wynn, the techno pagan octopus messiah, who, with Super Agent Peter Cox, have had the great pleasure of hosting Mr. Colin Edmonds. Thank you very much for your appearance on our show tonight and for your work in the past. I've really enjoyed your company. Thank, Thank you. you. Night night. Good night, everybody. I've got so much left.